Yeah, I'll let you. Uh... So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mitch Tanaki. I'm on the planning committee for B-Sides Boston. Oh, thanks, Nier. So I'm just here to introduce Nier. Uh, he's going to talk about statistics, threat intelligence, uh, threat hunting. He's from Threat Potion. Um, so he's near. He's a also at the end of the talk, these lovely ladies are going to be uh, tossing out T-shirts and stuff and stickers. So be on the lookout. All right, thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Hi everyone. How is everyone doing? Good. As well. So I took this photo you see up here while on vacation in the Caribbean, specifically in Saint Martin. And I remember taking that photo because at the same day, I received the email from B-Side informing me that my talk was accepted. So I, I, I remember taking the photo, sitting in a balcony, watching this beautiful sunset, feeling the Caribbean breathe, and thinking about what? My B-Side talk, right? So here's what we're going to talk about today. Um, the first thing I want to suggest is that threat intelligence data sets are growing and continue to grow. I will use some statistics and some numbers in order to prove my point. And then, since we are dealing with big data sets, I'll suggest data mining techniques. First classification, then scoring. Then I'll speak a little bit about threat intelligence investigation and I'll end up with threat intelligence effectiveness. If you guys have any questions at all, you can raise your hand or um, we can have some Q&A time at the end. So a little bit about myself. You probably guessed I'm not originally from the US. I was born in Israel. I served in the Israeli intelligence corps, specifically working with signal processing and visual intelligence. I graduated as a computer engineer and I moved to the US 15 years ago working for multiple vendors, specifically in the network security, in user behavior analytics, and obviously in threat intelligence. So what is threat intelligence in my mind? So as a threat intelligence engineer, I read a lot of reports coming in after every incident. And I like all the reports whether it's the pandas or the bears, the infrastructures or the Internet of Things, the uh, Middle East or the Americas. It's all very interesting. However, not everything that is interesting to me necessarily relevant to my customers. On the other hand, the customers think on imminent threats and risks that not necessarily match the actual threats landscapes. So threat intelligence to me is all about this middle ground. It's all about the overlap between the organization goals, the organization needs from one side, and threat intelligence landscape from the other. What's impact your critical asset, right? What's impact your vulnerabilities and your reputation? And since this is what threat intelligence cycle looks like in my mind. It all begins with objectives. We need to understand what are the requirements of the organizations. Are we looking at tactics, strategic, or operational threat intelligence? Do we want to work with the cyber kill chain model, or do we want to work with the diamond model? Once we set up the requirement, we look at collecting threat intelligence information. And threat intelligence comes from both internal and external sources. Give me one second. Okay. So, correction involves indicators of compromise. Now, those could be coming in from inside or from outside. And those indicators eventually will be deduplicated, aggregated, and normalized. The next step is taking the information into processing. What is processing? Processing is the phase where you are actually trying to make sense out of the threat data, right? 
And so this is the one I'm going to focus on mostly today. And eventually, dissemination. Threat intelligence should be actionable. We want to be able to send alerts into the IR team, to send information to the security operations center, send reports to management, and so on. So getting back to my first point, why threatened data sets will continue to grow? Starting at this chart, it shows you the predicted number of connected devices and people to the internet by 2020. Now we're currently around 28 here billion devices already connected to the internet, thanks to the Internet of Things. And this is going to grow up to 50 billion devices by 2020. As far as people, we have around 2 billion people connected today, and that number is going to grow as well to around 6 billion by 2020. Now, what did that mean? That means that both the network attack surfaces and the human attack surfaces will continue to grow. That means that there are going to be more surfaces for adversary to launch their attacks, more social engineering, more spear phishing, and so on. On top of that, there is a cybersecurity hiring crisis. We're already there. There are missing people from the cybersecurity workplace. And it is expected to get into one and a half million people missing from the security workplace by 2019. What that means is that there are going to be less defenders, going to be less people watching our networks and less threat intelligence engineers. And so, as a result, we will continue to have incidents coming in all the time. Here's an incident. <laughs> <laughs> and when we're getting, we're getting those incidents, the companies will share the information. There's going to be more and more data sets of threatened information, and therefore, data sets will continue to grow. Now, getting back into my vacation, how do you think the weather was in San Martin? So, me and my wife took the average of the temperature, calculated the standard deviation, and decided that 95% is going to be a good weather, right? No, we're not that crazy. We know weather in St. Martin will be always nice, <laughs> right? However, statistics is used for weather prediction and can be used in threat intelligence. So, this is an example of a, a chart done by Paolo Passeri from the Hack Megadon website. And it looks for the past three years of reported incidents. And the average is that we get 82 reported per month. This is only the reported incidents. We probably get much more. And then the standard variation 13, which means that more or less we can use this number as an average. And so let's try to find how many attacks are currently in progress the concurrent attacks. In order to find this, I need to take a dwell time. The dwell time is the time from the first intrusion until victims is actually detecting the attack, right? And statistics tells us that it is four months. So I'm taking four months divided by 82 incidents per month. There are 328 concurrent attacks, 328 companies under attack at this moment. And that's the bare minimum. Now, who are behind those attacks? Well, security companies identified around 50 adversary groups. There are thousands of hackers, and there are even more script kiddies, but big, huge adversary groups that can create damage that over 2 million records stolen, there are somewhere around 50. And you can see some of them here. They are anywhere between nation-state, cyber, crime, which is the ones we're going to focus on, hacktivists, and cyber terrorists. So let's look at the cyber crime one. Again, I'm just playing with numbers here. And I think that based on the 60% of hackers working in cyber crime, the 30 is, is an average number for this high-level, sophisticated hackers that can create a damage of 2 million records stolen and up. Now, again, looking at the statistics, we have around 45 incidents 
pair ear that match this size. And so what I can calculate here is how many successful attacks I have pair adversary. That makes sense? That basically tells me that each one of those 30 adversaries is having at least one successful attack per year. Now, if they're taking those records and selling them in the black market, in the dark web, they will get at least $10 per, per record. So being an adversary, one of those 30, pays off. Now, after each and every of those incidents, we have incident reports. And incident reports describes what has been done during the hack, tries to get all kinds of evidence clues, similarly to uh, those forensic evidence from a, cr from a crime scene. And those are called indicators of compromise. Who is familiar with indicators of compromise? Raise your hand. Great. So as you know, this, this could be IP addresses, domain names, URL, and so on. And those will indicate a probable intrusion in your network. So you want to get that list. And who's going to give it to you? There are many, many, many threat intelligence providers out there. From open source to commercials to private community. All of those create what I call a virtual threat library. That's kind of answering most of the questions you have regarding threat intelligence. And you can go, just like in the library, to each one of them and try to get the relevant answer to your question. Now, threat intelligence platforms can help you in here. Since uh, there are so many providers, you probably want to cross-correlate between all of them and look at them under one single pane of glass. And so, as a threat intelligence platform company, we have visibility to all of those indicators. And we see that an average indicators we get from each source is anywhere between 300 and 10,000 indicators per day. If you do the calculation, how many indicators you get per year, just the bare minimum. I'm taking 300 a day, and let's say I'm subscribed to four sources, I get almost half a million indicators per year. Now, from a security operation perspective, this is not practical. It's not manageable. You cannot push half a million indicators to the sensor grid, such as the firewalls or IDSs. And from security threat intelligence perspective, it is not practical as well because there's no way you get enough time to investigate so many indicators. So we have to do something. And my first advice is using classification. So we cannot talk about our vacation without food, right? Um, so let's see which food we had. So this was in St. Martin. I took this photo. And if I'll ask you which restaurant this came out, out of, is that a French, Dutch, Caribbean? It's really hard, right? What if I tell you that St. Martin has half Dutch and half French side? Is that going to help? Maybe. But still, classification could be a very hard task because classification is the process where you create categories and you decide which categories you need to put each and every item. Grouping is the next step. While you decide which classes you work, grouping is taking those items and just assigning them to the right category. But classification is very hard. And it is hard with threat intelligence as well. And so the default classification with threat intelligence feeds by the vendors are by, I, by type, by indicator type, right? We have IP addresses, domain names, URL, etc. Well, I suggest that classification using attributes, which are the context behind those indicators, can help you reduce the noise. As an example, we can look at a malware family. If we create grouping by malware family, we can create grouping by the kill chain process. So identify each indicator, which phase within the kill chain they're related to. We can identify it by, by geographical location, languages, and so on. 
Another way to classify is looking at target attacks and looking at adversaries that are after finance or after healthcare or after infrastructure, and then identify our industry and look at those that are relevant to us. Incidents or events, those are indicators that all came from the same event or the same incident. So regardless of the type, they're kind of part of the same kill chain. And I want to put them together and see if there's any correlation, if I can understand what really was the process of events. Okay? And finally, to my first point, if you can find out relevant indicators to your organization, that would be the best. If you can sort your indicators, pair the specific devices you're using, the specific vulnerabilities that are relevant to your company, that's probably the best. That makes sense? Great. So the threat caution research team was conducting a small test around the attributes. What we did here is we took four different sources, and for each one of the sources, we measured the number of attributes that uh, describe the different indicators. Now, it's a little bit hard to see it here, but on the left-hand side, those are the different sources, and you can see some of them give 12 attributes, uh, one of them is giving three. On the right-hand side, we're trying to cross-correlate. We, we're trying to see what is the overlap between the vendors. And unfortunately, there is a very little overlap, which means that most of the vendors have vendor-specific terminologies and ways to describe the threat intelligence. And that's a challenge because it makes it hard for us to normalize the data. And so there are some community-driven efforts in the market in order to standardize threat intelligence communication. Open IOC and Stick Taxi are the, some of them. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to create terms that will be able to be exchanged between an organization. And rather than having it vendor specific, it's going to be a standard. However, none of them is really adapted 100% yet. And even if it's going to be adapted, I suggest that there's still going to be noise needs to be cleaned out on indicators. So here's one example of a very noise indicator. So this is what our research group was looking when they found that hash values are relatively much more noisy than registry key, for example. You can see that there are many more indicators in average. Now, this could be a result of having a lot of command and, and control information and a lot of malware is coming down and hashes being created. And as you know, adversaries figured out a long time ago that the defenders using hash values to detect. And so what they do is they keep on creating those mutations, right? A way to go around it is to create a sectional hashing. What is a sectional hashing? Sectional hashing is when you look into the malware and try to create hashes of the specific functions within it. And so if the adversary will change a portion of a malware, still there's a chance that the some other hashes will match those IOCs. Another way is fuzzy hashing. So unlike regular hashing, which change totally different the, the hash value whenever there's a small change, fuzzy hashing is showing the similarities between two files. So if two files have a little different between them, the fuzzy hash will have a different little as well. Another relatively noisy indicators we found is the indicators associated with the command and control. So looking at the kill chain steps, the reconnaissance delivery relatively has a manageable number of indicators. The command and control is very noisy for many reasons. First, there are a lot of botnets out there that communicating to different uh, servers, but there are also adversary created techniques such as the um, domain generation algorithm, which have the malware trying to communicate with thousands of fake domains. And so sandboxes will create thousands of indicators around it. However, none of those domains could be registered. And so my suggestion is 
try to subgroup the indicators related to command and control, see which one are a generation based on the domain generation algorithm and which one are a result of an existing valid register domain. And by the way, there are already machine learning techniques that are trying to figure out whether it's a valid domain by analyzing the name and see if it makes any sense in English. If it doesn't make any sense in English, it's just gibberish, high chance that it's a result of domain generating algorithm. So we spoke about classification. Let's speak a little bit about rating, but we have to get back to our vacation. Um, so before coming to the vacation, we had to pick up the resort. And like most of you probably do, by the way, if you want to know which resort we went to, you can come after and I'll let you know. <laughs> the, the way we did it is probably like everyone does, which is looking at rating, reading reviews, trying to score and then decide which one of those we should go with, right? We can do the same thing with threat intelligence feeds. So this is a project done by Alex Pinto. Uh, he was creating the MLSEC open source project. And he had some interesting test here. He calls the novelty test. And what this, this test is trying to see is how many indicators are added within time and how many indicators are removed within time uh, over different type of threat intelligence sources. So this one is interesting. You can see here that there are indicators added within time, but there's almost no indicators removed over time, right? Which means that this list is going to continue grow. And it's also a challenge because we know indicators have a lifespan. Like I said earlier, adversary keep on changing them. And so if we're not going to expire the indicator or remove them from the list, we're going to end up with the noise at some point. This is another uh, pattern. Here you can see a spike of removed indicators and a little bit added. Again, some quiet time, then another spike, quiet time, and another spike. And that could be a challenge as well, because theoretically, threat intelligence stream should be steady, should be continuous. It could be some uh, new malware that is being released out there that will create a spike, but for the long run, it couldn't have this pattern. This might suggest that the source is collecting all the information and not sending it to you in a timely manner, which means that you might get your indicators too late. And another example of a pattern where it, this is an extreme situation where the source is adding and removing the same amount of indicator every day. It's very novel, very, very up to speed. So that's one way to look at the indicators. Now we can use the pyramid of pain uh, to un understand which indicators we need to expire or retire first. So the pyramid of pain created by David Bianco suggests that on the lower part of the pyramid, hash values, IP address and domain names are relatively easy to change by the adversary, and therefore, they're going to be having a short life cycle. On the other hand, the tools like the malwares, infrastructures, and tactic techniques and procedures, who are more of behavioral indicators, those are harder to change by the adversary, and therefore, those are going to be relevant for longer. So that's one way to look at it. This is another interesting test, which is called the overlap test. And here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to compare multiple sources to the other sources. And we compare the source to themselves in the middle here. And 100% overlap is obvious because when you, when you compare the, the source to itself, it's 100%, right? But look at the indicators coming in from multiple sources compared with other sources. You see, all the white area here represent zero or close to zero overlap between the vendors, which means that there are multiple threat intelligence sources. They all come to us. They're all telling us we have the best threat intelligence that you have or you should have, and none of them has an overlap, which brings up the question, which one should I go with, right? They're all telling us they're good. 
And so that's where scoring gets into play. That's where scoring can help us identify eventually which sources are relevant to us. And there's no right and wrong here. All those sources might be relevant to specific companies. You just want to find those that are relevant to your organization. And so what are the scoring uh, criteria? Well, indicator types, we spoke about it. They are indicators that have a little bit lower life cycle. Uh, but also your organization might, might be more driven towards host-based indicators rather than network-based indicators. Sources. Generally speaking, or intuitively, you might want to score commercial sources higher than open sources because you pay them, right? And then maybe community-driven that are specific to one sector even higher than commercial. Another score can be pair attributes. So like I mentioned earlier, all the indicators coming in with attributes. And so at some point, you will get a feeling on those attributes that really contribute to your investigation versus those that are not. And you can have an indicator with 20 attributes that are not helping you at all, or an indicator with two attributes that are the ones you really need. And finally, adversary. Similarly to what I mentioned earlier, you want to score based adversaries and pairs target. So malware is interesting. We said we want to sort indicators per malware, but what do we do with that? This is an example of the malware and the number of indicators associated with them. And the first thing I want to note is that the number of indicators associated with the a malware doesn't say anything about the popularity of this malware. Doesn't mean anything. Uh, for example, we know Lucky was malware number one for ransomware during 2016. You can see here, we don't get so many indicators around it. Um, but JS Dropper is just a noisy type of dropper, and it creates a lot of indicators around it. So the way to score is definitely not based on how many indicators you have around the malware, but rather, what is the distribution mechanism? Is it a weaponized document that this malware is going to target you? or maybe the vector is exploit kit, is that malware um, piece re uh, responsible for actually installing, dropping? What is the process within this whole uh, malware installation that you're looking for? Those are the criteria that are relevant for you. And those are just three additional ideas that I believe we can have a whole new talk for each one of them on what scoring could be based up on. So I personally believe that correlation with your internal tools, like the SIEM or the user behavior analytics, is a great criteria for high scores. Why? Because if you have a specific indicators that found within your SIEM, and the same time there's an external source telling you that this indicator is bad, Either it's a false positive, and then you can take it out of the way, or it's something really bad happening in your network, right? You definitely want to know about that. Signal to noise. With time, you get a feeling on which indicators are more noisy, like I mentioned earlier. Using signal to noise will help you reduce the amount of work of your threat intelligence team. And confidence. One of the things you have with everything to do with threat intelligence is confidence. How much you trust this source? How much you trust this indicator? Is it being scored by one source or being scored by four sources? Is the margin of error 10% or 40%? You want to go with the one, of course, with a higher confidence and the lower margin of error. So we established that scoring can help you now Question, when I say umbrella, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? Rain. Anyone else? Cisco umbrella. <laughs> Drink with umbrella, very good. None of you refer to the umbrella you're going to see now. That's the umbrella I think of when I'm on vacation in the Caribbean on a beach. So the point is, context is very important, right? And Similarly, with, with indicators, you want to have context. If you have an IP address, and the IP address is related to spear phishing, it's totally different than an IP address related to a command and control, right? 
And so context is very important. Unfortunately, we're not always getting the context. There's many reasons for that, but there are known unknowns, and we should be aware of the known unknowns. Why we don't know everything about all the incidents? Well, to begin with, organizations not sharing all the information they have about their incidents, right? Mainly information that undermine their reputation or vulnerability. They will not share everything with you. They will share what they feel comfortable with. The other things are steps within the kill chain that you know should be there and you're missing the information. So an example for spare phishing, I know there was an email address. I just don't, and I know that there was a file and I know that there was a subject. I just don't know what the email subject was. And so I have an idea what I need to look for since I understand the, uh, the, the process of the attack. And statistics tell us there are somewhere around 40% unknown techniques used out there. Whether it's a zero day, target attacks, you don't see out in the wild because they are targeting only you. Uh, or just new techniques the uh, attackers are developing, the same way we develop our new defense mechanisms. And so in order, in order to answer those, oops, sorry. In, in, in order to answer those uh, questions, we use enrichment tools. And the way I see enrichment tools is like this lifeline in Who Wants to Be a Millionaire television show. You have different ways to fill up the gap, right? You can have the, the audience, questioning for the audience, which is kind of crowdsourcing. So an example of the audience is VirusTotal. Anyone familiar with VirusTotal? Yeah. So what you do, you upload the malware, then you ask multiple scanners what they think about it, and you got your answer. Then you can decide what you do with it. The friend or the telephone friend, I think they call it, that's when you have a specific question. Let's say you have extreme rat and you, want, you have a question about the delivery mechanism, and you know that specific vendor is specialized in extreme rat, you will go to that specific vendor. And finally, like I showed you earlier, you can use statistics also to reduce the noise. So 50-50 is good enough, hopefully you'll get better. Another interesting investigation tool is what we call link analysis. And this is an example from mm, uh, social network analysis from 9-11. So this graph shows the original suspect of the 9-11 attack. And what it illustrates is all the 19 hijackers are within two steps from the original suspects coming in in 2000. Also, by looking at the graph and the egocentric part here, we identify the recruiter, the leader who recruited all those hijackers. So this illustrates how you can use link analysis in investigation, identify who are, what are the answers. And this question was, what is the relationship between the recruiters and the hijackers? And we can drill down and do the same thing with adversaries in the cybersecurity world. We can also create relationship between transactions, relationship between objects, between servers, between IP addresses. So this is an example of Deep Panda, which is a Chinese adversary actor, and how they relate to the Sakula malware family. And you can see here, this is coming in from Maltego, and the graphic shows that this is one, two, I'm good that the Deep Panda was connected to a specific IP. That IP was associ associated to this domain name, who is trying to spoof WellPoint, if they put one instead of the L, and WellPoint is, uh, is, a further, uh, is another name for Anthem. And then you can go track back to the droppers and to the original malware and to the sandbox it was running under. So the way I see it, Threat intelligence investigation is very close to any other investigation. You have a cyber security area where you have a crime scene. You have adversaries who are the suspects, right? You have the fingerprints who are the indicators. You have the body who is the victim. And you're trying to solve a mystery. 
And it's very similar to the game Clue, which I'm not aware of because I'm from Israel, but they told me you all will be aware of. <laughs> and and that's, that, is, um, that is the way I look at it. It's almost like a detective work. And that's why the human element is really important here. They are all questions that no one by person with intuition would be able to answer. So one more photo from my vacation. And this is the nightlife. This is my daughter. Um, I didn't take many photos at the, the nights there, so I'm sorry about the, the quality. But I like it because sh she's mesmerized by this band playing outside our hotel. And what I like about it is that it illustrates how a group of people can create an experience that is much higher than each of those people individually. I really like this photo, and I think it's also relevant to threat intelligence. Because threat intelligence teams work in collaboration can create much better results than each one of the individual. The collaboration is really relevant for threat intelligence investigation. However, I do believe machine learning has some type of a role in threat intelligence investigation in the future. So I can see how, for example, machine learning classification algorithms can create uh, a prediction on whether an indicator is a false positive or not. Uh, another example is decision trees. I can see how machine learning can create some kind of a workflow for the IR team that will be more uh, informative than intuitive, for example. So we're getting to the end of our vacation, and like I said, machine learning and the human elements is something we need to work together in order to get a more efficient threat intelligence. But what else we can learn about threat intelligence efficiency? How we can really measure the effectiveness of our work? Well, the way I look at it is looking at the time to detection and time to respond. So if there's anything within the threat intelligence activities we do that help reduce the time to detection or time to respond, we did our work. We contributed to the technology. Um, we helped the, the defensors. And eventually, I see the role of threat intelligence is supporting the threat defense effectiveness. And so the threat defense effectiveness um, is basically a way for us to look at any new technology getting into the market. If you're looking at any technology, at some point, it is very efficient, like firewalls, IDSs. Then the adversary get a hold of this technology and then they compromise. They find all those vulnerabilities and it becomes much less effective and then the vendors are bouncing back and creating some, some type of sustaining kind of uh, mode. And so our goal of threat intelligence teams is to push this curve up and to the right into the red dotted line and make it much more hard for the adversary to attack us, make it much more expensive and less profitable for the attackers, help share our information with the security operation teams, reduce the asymmetric between us and the adversary, and eventually identify those exploitations both in applications and in credentials. So getting back into the beginning, threat intelligence is all about this common ground. It's the overlap between the organization goals from one side and the threat intelligence landscape for the other. So I want to thank my wife for organizing a great vacation. I want to thank my kids for not so bad behavior. <laughs> and uh, those are the numbers that we spoke about during uh, the talk. We talk about how threat data sets will grow up continue to grow, how we can use data mining for classification and for scoring, and how investigation and effectiveness can help us assess our threat intelligence. Thanks, and have a great day. <laughs> we have any time for questions? If anyone wants a shirt or a giveaway, can come here. But, but meanwhile, questions? Can anyone bring him the... Yeah. Yeah. What are you using to verify the links between the threat actors? 
So we use threat intelligence feed to verify the link between threat actors. So some of the feeds are indicator based, but other ones are also related to specific adversaries. The other thing we're doing is we cross correlate. So if there are two threat actors that, for example, share the same infrastructure, or there is some similarity between the two malwares coming in from them, we can identify it within our threat intelligence platform. So you're looking at like specific malware and indications Yeah, we're looking at specifically on malware, uh, history of using the malware, and the location, if they are sharing the same infrastructure. Yes, please. Yes, absolutely. So the question was about the Carnegie Hall paper, which we already have it as well. I was actually thinking maybe to put that as well. Um, I think the problem, the main problem is that there are different ways to look at threat intelligence. I don't think any of the vendors is you know, giving you bad or trying to give you bad data, but I think each one of them is looking at different aspects. The fact that there is very little overlap between the attributes doesn't help it. And so I believe that unfortunately we do need to take all those threats end up with one threat intelligence platform that can process them and filter the noise and get the, the right indicators that are relevant to you. And in, in, internal intelligence too. Internal intelligence is very important. One of the things that I, I kind of mentioned is that a lot of the feeds we're using are internal feeds. So it feeds from your um, endpoint solutions, feed from your firewalls, feed from your uh, SIEM, your user behavior analytics. Cross-correlated those with the external feeds will give you the best intelligence. Thank you so much.